Okay, here we go. We're going to talk about personality this time. Uh, personality as a psychological structure, as a subject in the uh, research area of psychology, which is called personality. And what is that? What are we talking about? When we talk about psychology, we talk about personality and psychology. We're talking people who have personality or don't have personality. Oh, you look at a picture of somebody and say, wow, look at that. Well, or maybe not wow. But the person, you can see that that person has personality, right? What does that mean? It's so difficult to understand uh, if we're going to just use the normal, everyday, uh, colloquial word personality. Because um, some people have personality, some people don't. No, we would say we would think that everybody has some personality. Uh, he's got a good personality, a bad person. Well, generally speaking, if you've got John says to Mary that Joan has a good personality, right? Uh, that probably means that you know she's a fun person to be with. It's good to have around. That's a good personality. It's a she's got personality, um, and that sort of is the way we often use it uh, in everyday language. But that wouldn't be very helpful because um, it doesn't show the whole broad range and uh, it does seem to uh, point to one particular thing that we do need to see in personality and that <coughs> is that it needs to be something enduring, something which lasts for a long, long, long time. I mean, let, for instance, let's say you know your, you remember your cousin Karen. She grew up as a spoiled girl in the suburbs, a uh, wealthy family, never needed anything, had a, a, a television in every room, and uh, she was driving a car, by her own car, at age 16, and a uh, computer when she needed, and the, the latest games and the latest styles, and a sweet 16 party that cost $20,000, some, some re never wanted for anything. Uh, but that was many, many years ago, and now she's, uh, this 15, 20 years have gone by, and you hear that she's living up in a cabin someplace up in Vermont, in a mountain someplace. And you say to yourself, how could that be? How could this kid choose to live in, a, uh, in, in, in such deprivation without anything um, I got to go see her. I mean, I can't picture what's going on. Is that the same person that I knew 20 years ago? So you get yourself up there and you sit down and you're talking to her for an hour and a half and you know what? She is the same person. Her priorities seem to have changed maybe, but there's something about her which seems the same. That would have to be her personality. And that's what we seem to be talking a, a a stable uh, a, a stable, consistent pattern of feeling, thinking, and behaving, regardless of circumstance. So that would tend to indicate that what we're talking about is something which um, is almost embedded in the biology of a person, something which is stuck in a person's brain. And that is exactly where psychologists first looked for personality characteristics and uh, causes and, and co co uh, coordinates of personality in a study of phrenology. Now, we don't really believe in this anymore, but it's sort of like good to know because, first of all, you see these all the time. These busts with the with the this area is controls that area of the brain, and what it actually did was the idea was that if um, a particular area of the brain was, for instance, controlled altruism, if somebody was very altruistic, that part of the brain would grow more, and then you'd be able to tell that per, that that person has an altruistic personality because it would then push the skull out a little bit more, and a person the shape of a person's head would uh, would reflect his inborn traits which define the personality. Now, this is not re really accepted anymore. Uh, I mean, you look at the baby's head and his, his head is shaped a little bit different. Does mean his personality has changed? Uh, don't quite think so. Um, I, could we look at uh, somebody's head and say this is what he likes, his, his uh, volleyball and basketball in a particular 
uh, area, there's music, there's, I don't quite think so. Although there is something which even today is almost analogous because we do say that there are particular parts of the brain which control particular areas and behaviors and types of thinking. For instance, in the prefrontal cortex, if uh, controls impulsivity. So if a person has an impulsive personality, it's probably reflected in the structure of his brain. Or if there's damage in the prefrontal cortex, he might become very impulsive, etc., etc. So there is some sort of um, legacy to phrenology in modern psychology. Uh, another very uh, popular at one point idea was somatology, which we don't really consider. This is a fellow named Sheldon uh, back in the 1940s. And he said that more body fee- fat, right, a fatter person, a person who naturally has would be called an endomorph, a very skinny person called being ectomorph, and an average sort of person would be a mesomorph. And these ectomorphs, mesomorphs, and endomorphs um, were um, were reflective of possible personality traits. For instance, uh, if somebody was a endomorph, he's more likely to be assertive and bold where the skinny people, the ectomorphs, will likely be interviewed introverted and intellectual. But there ain't a lot of scientific evidence to back up this uh, somatology type of business. Um, so we really don't consider these early ideas of correlation of body type uh, or brain type or brain structure to personality. Although there's one sort of thing which we call physiognomy, which has a, um, a, a bit of validation by current research, and that's that we can access um, or understand uh, personality and facial characteristics. Like I say, there is some good research, particularly it says whether uh, people are gay or straight or Democrats or Republicans, um, and that's uh, pretty good. And as a matter of fact, they even have um, digitized this, so you can digital physiognomy, and you can uh, put in somebody's face and try to figure out if they are... Um, uh, what type of character they have and personality they have. Uh, some famous people. Uh, you can see here that they're sort of use uh, Clinton and uh, see that he is clever, honest, and optimist. Uh, and, oh well, uh, two out of three ain't bad, I suppose, right? Um, so that is possibilities of doing it by external stuff. Um, but, you know... That's not where the psychology is today or where the main uh, areas of psychology is. Uh, we'd like to think really that we, the, the um, study of personality or the study of understanding the structure of personality uh, or measurement of personality, in truth, most of the... Um, mainstream psycholo- psychology uh, research in personality goes back to this guy here, Gordon Alpert, back in the 1930s, who looked at traits, personality traits. He really wanted to find a nosology, a categorization, a way of defining one personality as different or unique from the other. And uh, he used words to do it, a lexicological uh, research. He took all the words in the dictionary that can be used to describe personality traits. And there was quite a lot of them to go, to say the least. All sorts of words and words and words and words and words and words. And, words. and uh, you can't imagine how many words he came up with. Um, 18,000 words to describe personality back in 1936. That was a bit much, so they worked on it and tried to uh, narrow it down. They came down to 4,500. Well, okay, so that's a lot better than uh, 18,000. But 4,500 is also difficult. And so a fellow named Cattell, 
narrowed it down to about 12. He added another force, it would be 16. Um, and it's called 16 personality factors, or 16 PF, right? Which is the base for many tests that they use now, but that was also difficult to work with. It didn't work well. A fellow named uh, W.T. Norman hypothesized that only five, uh, uh, five factors. And he came up through a statistical analysis, factor analysis, uh, with five basic um, personality uh, factors, the model of five, which um, can be broken down to O-C-E-A-N. Um, five different pers- uh, factors. And all the other factors that one could find up can really be brought down into these. Openness, which is, uh, or conscientiousness, um, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. And those are five basic factors. And in truth, quite a huge amount of personality um, personality research has done on the is done using the big five uh, much more than the other. Even though with Cattell's sixteen personality factors are still used today uh, in personality testing, most of personality research seems to go on these. Um, uh, five things. Now, I I use this O-C-E-A-N, ocean, as one way of remembering as mnemonic. You can also say canoe, C-A-N-O-E. But these are five basic factors. And what are they? What are, they? What are these five basic factors? Uh, okay. The first one is openness, right? In other words, a person who likes art, adventure, imagination, curiosity. They're willing to go out and do things and experience new stuff. Um, there's something which uh, uh, gives them a, uh, motivates them to be involved in uh, adventure. Something involves a new stuff. And it's not really related to the other possibilities. So that's the first one is openness, right? Art, artist, um, art, art, people like new art or go out and do exciting things or change, um, you know, like, have no problem changing. Uh, that would be the first of the, uh, of the big five. The second one is conscientiousness. Uh, again, a tendency to show self-discipline, act dutifully, or aim for achievement. Now, I got to point out that this is not necessarily that a person ha- is only conscientious. It could be opposite of conscientious. It's where he is on that um, positive to negative. So a conscientious person will act dutifully, but somebody who is low in conscientiousness will act uh, without self-discipline. It will be other, the other uh, extreme. Uh, conscientiousness means you're going to work hard and do things, and you're going to get further because you're going to uh, want to achieve and get, uh, gain your goal. Um, as against somebody without self-discipline will never gain his goal, but that's really where they are on the other, uh, on this axis of conscientiousness. It could be either very, very high or very, very low, but this is an axis, this is a part of something that you can look at in, um, in, in uh, self-achievement, uh, in the personality. Another one could be extroversion. How much you uh, want to look out uh, and seek out stimulation, and particularly in the company of others, to be with people, basically, to enjoy the company of others, or on the other hand, to uh, shy away and not want to have the company of others. One extreme or the other. This would be uh, the uh, number three of the big five, the way we're counting them today. And you can think of people like that. Think of people who are more or less extroverted, or the opposite would be introverted. Uh, to be somebody who is introverted and not want, doesn't like the company of others, wants to be far away, or t- pretends to be a loner. Uh, obviously, that would have nothing to do with conscientious. Somebody could be conscientious and either be uh, like people or not like people. Or somebody could be open to new experiences, but not with people. Uh, I like I interested in, uh, in 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 art. A solitary person who's interested in new things of art or music. Uh, or somebody who is likes people but not interested and not conscientious. So these uh, factors, the important thing is that they are all important. 
they go from positive to negatives and they do not necessarily correlate with the, with the other. The fourth one, agreeableness, which means basically a tendency to be compassion cooperative rather than suspicious or antagonistic, to help people, to want to be nice to people or to be mean and ugly to people, uh, a concern for social harmony. Uh, there are uh, this this is uh, number four. And the number five piece would be uh, neuroticism, right? A tendency to be over-emotional um, or uh, very calm or very calm or angry or ang- anxious, anxious or not or depressed, right? So, you know, these are aspects of what we call neuroticism, right? Um this if you uh, tend to get over emotional or very very on the other hand um, so those are the um, the five uh, big uh, big five factors that we can actually then all the other words all the other 18,000 words uh, that were originally found by Golden, Gordon Alport um, they all uh, can be brought down at least in a statistical manner to say that they are component pieces of any of these five uh the openness to expression the conscientiousness the extroversion agreeableness or neuroticism now is that good does that actually help us um it turns out that it cannot be used to predict behavior um it's it won't uh, be used to predict a specific behavior in a specific situation right but they are good for knowing that somebody is was like. If somebody will be good at the job in a normal circumstance, or I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do it my own way. Uh, so they are good when you want to know a basic personality, a tendency which is um, predictable over time and circumstance. Um, it won't be able to be good for predicting a particular behavior in a particular situation, but they're certainly good for predicting um, predicting the way a, a person tends to be. Not in specific situations, but it will be a good description of traits over a long period of time.